Welcome to Amazing Business Radio with best-selling author and customer service and business expert, Shep Hyken. Shep will talk with some of the smartest thinkers in business to help make you more successful in your professional and personal life. This is Amazing Business Radio with Shep Hyken. Hello, everybody. It's Shep Hyken, and we're back with another episode of Amazing Business Radio. And I am extremely excited about this guest. Now, I say that every time we do an episode, which is every week. But this time, here is why. Because Scott Pickrell, who uh, has come, has an incredible background with numerous companies. But the companies he's with right now is Fender. Yes, Fender, the guitar company. And for those that know me, and if you've listened to the show for a while, you'll occasionally hear you talk about music. I am an avid musician and guitar player. I love it. And Scott is the VP of Inside Sales Service and Sales Operations. And he's going to talk to us uh, about what a company does, like Fender, a brand that's recognized within a big industry uh, on how they are creating an incredible customer experience. Before we get into that, a couple of quick announcements. If you've got a story you want to share or a question you want to ask, be sure to reach out to me on any of the social media channels. If it is a question, use the hashtag AskShep. I'll answer it there in that channel, on my blog, on a video, on this show, or maybe my TV show, Be Amazing or Go Home. You can catch episodes on Amazon, Roku, Apple TV, and BeAmazing.tv. That's BeAmazing.tv. All right, let's jump into the interview. Scott. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Shep. I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm first of all, people can't see this. Typically, everybody's listening to this, although we put some of like excerpts of video on there. But you are my bald brother from another mother. Uh, <laughs> you are just as shiny on top. I take my glasses off. If we turn around, you wouldn't know the difference between us. Yeah, so. we're doppelgangers, right? So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, great to have you here. Fender guitar. So I was so intrigued when your PR company reached out to me because I am a musician. Many people may know this, some that don't. Now they do. I own uh, quite a few guitars. Several of them are Fenders. And when they said that I could talk to the VP of inside sales service and sales operation, I couldn't wait because you have a lot to share. You not only sell to the end user, a consumer like myself, but you also sell uh, through retailers. And uh, we are going to talk about all the great things that Fender, which is an iconic brand in its industry, is doing for its customers. Sound fair? That sounds great. Great. So um, let's start right off the top. Uh, we're going to focus primarily on the service. What is your involvement with customer service and creating a service experience for your customers? Yeah, we we have a couple of different uh, servicing vehicles and arms within my division. We we not only support the, the dealer network, which is our retailers, but we also support our consumers, which is more on the direct consumer side. Um, we do a lot of things from a qualitative standpoint to help improve the process. We are never satisfied with current state. Uh, I would argue that we have a continuous improvement mindset. So uh, over the last few years, we've taken a look at our hiring guidelines. We've taken a look at our training manuals, and we've implemented what I believe is a robust quality uh, assurance program that helps us not only uh, prevent uh, errors from happening, but it really helps us drive continuous improvement into the future. And it's it's been relatively received well by the employees, and it's helped improve our service overall with our customers. Right. So tell me, I'm a I'm a consumer. I buy yeah. guitars, and uh, I you you mentioned uh, I'm looking at my notes here. Continuous improvement. Yeah. Is it about the product, the quality of the product, or is it about how you handle your customers? It's all of the above. So not only, I, I break it down into two parts. Quality control, which is taking a look at what happens in that moment in time that we're handling the customer. And then quality assurance, which is more of an end-to-end -end process review to make sure that everything is working as designed. Um, from a quality control standpoint, we'll monitor calls uh, to make sure that they are following the guidelines and the plans that we've outlined for them. But we're also looking for anything that could cause drift in the process. So if we have a, a shipping issue or a qualitative issue that comes out of operations, we want to understand what those volumes are, what the friction points are, and that drives that continuous improvement where we reach out to our functional business partners and start developing a plan for what I would call remediation or corrective action. All right. Functional business partners being the retailers? 
it could be the retailers. It could be our internal uh, internal product teams. It could be our operations teams. It could be our distribution center. It could be our supply chain. It's wherever we think that there's maybe drift in the process that are creating delays or what I would call customer churn. And then we pull together and what put together what I like to call a good, better, best strategy. What can we fix right now that would be good? How can we make it better over the course of the next couple of weeks? And then what's the point of arrival look like from a best strategic plan strategy? Sometimes and oftentimes that that's automation. That takes the human touch out of it and creates a more automated, clean experience. I love it. Good, better, best. That that alone is a great lesson. Um, so uh gosh, you know, I'm going down this path and I just can't help but think, you know, here I am talking to an executive of like to me, an iconic brand because I'm a musician. I got to get that out of my head and we got to focus more on what you're doing to create that experience. So you mentioned uh, you've got friction points. So those friction points typically happen. The way I see them is at the top level. It happens where customers, whoever they are, whether they be retailers or consumers, interact with your brand. But then you also mentioned all this going on behind the scenes that's driving that experience. We call those impact points. So you are really focused on trying. I mean, you're looking at that top line, the journey of a typical uh, different customers, but the typical journey that a customer of whatever type of business they're in or consumer has with you. And you're looking at what drives those. And you are trying to figure out where the friction is. How do we make it better? And behind the scenes, there's a lot going on that makes that. People don't realize it. There's this one little point. It's like, we're getting ready to ship your guitar. OK, mm-hmm. and behind the scenes, there's 74 things that happen, happen, have to happen before you receive that guitar. That's correct. I, I You know, I'll, I'll give you a, a phrase that I like to use. Data is the ultimate equalizer. We're a we're a data driven company. And so we we've in our quality plan, we've built a statistically valid sample routine where we will extract calls. We will extract emails. We have chat functionality. We will pull all those into an audit document and we will actually listen to calls. We do leadership executive listening sessions. Um, We also do uh, um, process reviews with our business partners. But ultimately, if I see that, you know, let's say 50 percent of our calls are related to a specific issue, then what I do is ask to to get an adverse sample. And what an adverse sample is, is let's go target calls to see if that let's say if it's shipping we would want to know, let's target those calls, let's pull those calls, and let's listen to see if we're hearing the same thing. We pull that data together, we take a look at our case volume, we true it up and then meet with our, our, our business partners to say, hey, I'm getting feedback from customers in the last two weeks regarding X. Uh, I believe we need to do Y. What does it take to close the gap to ensure that we have a better process going forward? Um, we've seen mounds of improvement in our in our SLAs as a result. We've seen our qualitative st- scores go up because we're creating talking points for our, for our, uh, for our employees. And then we update our, our manuals. It's one thing to listen to something. It's another thing to take action. We're all about doing both. What's the, what's the feedback that we're getting from the customer and what feedback do we need to provide to our internal or external business partners to improve the process? Wow. You know, we do this exercise with our clients uh, when when we do a training project with them. And one of the things we ask is, what are the most common complaints or problems that you hear about? Yeah. And we have them working in groups, the audience works in groups, and they come up with whatever their problems are hearing. And we put it on a whiteboard and we we prioritize what are the biggest problems, which if we could only solve three, what would they be? By the way, one of the things I always ask, and this is to your point, I go, well, how often does this happen? Right. And people go like all the time, every day. And I'm thinking, okay, you know what's happening? Why are you not doing something about it? And it sounds to me like you have created the process to, uh, if not eliminate, at least mitigate the problems. And you're watching and monitoring to make sure if you're hearing, because if you've got in the last two weeks, you're hearing about a problem, there's something in the production line that might be an issue that, oh my gosh, we got to go back and fix something. So we don't six months from now, keep hearing about this. 
Yeah, we we partner very closely with our operations team. They too have a quality group that we partner with in case there are issues around that. Uh, I think for us, the biggest thing that we do is we we document it. We create tags. We have a we have a CRM customer relationship management platform that we can tag certain issues. So, for example, if I've got a day where my team is telling me that we've had ten occurrences with an issue, we create a tag for it and we monitor that over the next day or two to see if it's an anomaly or if it's something that actually is brewing. And then we immediately jump on with our business partners to say, "Hey, are you aware of this? This is something that's emerging." And then we have to pivot to our our, our, uh, our our wholesale side to make sure that they're aware because they're going to start hearing it from their retailers. I would say anything that we learn from our direct-to-consumer channel, we take those best practices and partner with our outside sales channel uh, that handles the wholesale business because we want to be able to not only proactively communicate what we're learning, but some of these dealers and some of these retailers are actively building their .com websites, and we want to be able to share our best practices with them to make them successful. And we do that on a routine basis. All right. So, um, there, boy, there's like two or three lessons here. The first is you're using consumer um, commentary to fix problems that will, you're, because ultimately you can fix it for the consumer, but guess who else is going to hit get hit with this? And that's the retailer. Right. When their customers who are buying their your guitars through them or you know whatever it is that you're selling through them, um, they're going to come back with the same issues that you're hearing. So you've got to fix that. And your retailer base, you, you can't mess with that. The other thing I'm hearing, and this is really important, is that you're treating your retailers. The retailer sees you as a vendor. That's what you are. But I would bet they kind of think of you as a partner. Because if you're yeah. partnering with them and helping them at this level, you're not just selling them a product for them to turn around, mark up, and sell to a customer. You're doing much more to help them be successful in their business. Plus, you're teaching them some of your best practices. That's right. Uh, I had a leader tell me one time, feedback is one of the few things in life that's free. And so if we aren't taking that feedback and doing something with it, shame on us, because it not only will will hurt our overall strategy in the future, but we lose trust with our consumers or our retailers. And that's something in today's world you just can't afford. I think if anything that we've learned now that we're, you know, still in the latter stages of the of the pandemic is consumer obviously buying behavior started shifting to uh, to online uh, more online uh, purchases which means we've had an increase of people that are staying at home more wanting to either play the guitar or work on their house or do something that they normally wouldn't have had the time to do and so they're expecting real time feedback they're expecting urgency and what immediate to you is maybe different to me. So we have to set the right expectations, make sure that we constantly communicate with our teams to ensure that we are creating one communication style back to the consumer or back to the retailer so we're not creating confusion. Because the, the one thing that can come back to bite you is social media. A lot of people will go out and spend their time on social media if they've had a bad experience. We know that, we monitor for that, and that's something that we take very seriously so we can continue to improve the process. All right, so we're going to take a break. When we come back, there's two things I want to talk about. Okay. I want to talk about feedback because this is a big piece you said, so important. And I have a list of items here to talk to you about. And number two, I want to talk to you about how you handle the social media criticism that's out there because yeah. everybody wants to know, how do I handle uh, yeah. you know, those haters, <laughs> if yeah. you will? So yeah. we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. We're talking with Scott Pickerel, who is the Vice President of Sales Service and Sales Operations for Fender. And this is Amazing Business Radio. Don't go away. Let's talk about Text Expander, a tool that allows your team to eliminate repetitive typing with just a few keystrokes. Anything you type over and over, such as customer responses, will be at your team's fingertips so they have the power to do what they do best, just faster. Quickly reply to emails and chats from a library of responses that you create, completing answers to common questions and issues. Your entire team stays on the same page with the same common responses that can be personalized on the fly. And it's simple to use. Type commonly used content into a text expander snippet and give it an abbreviation of just a few letters and symbols. Share the snippet with the team. When you type the abbreviation, it triggers the snippet and the content expands anywhere you type, including email, chat, or social media. It's that easy. 
Just go to www.textexpander.com to learn more about this amazing and productive tool. Sign up for a year and get 20% off. You're listening to Amazing Business Radio with best-selling author and customer service and business expert, Shep Hyken. We're back on Amazing Business Radio talking with Scott Pickerel of Fender. And, you know, Scott, before uh, we get into the question I have about social media and how you monitor social and what happens when somebody out there decides to uh, criticize you, complain about you, which I hope they never do. They shouldn't. But, hey, it's out there. Even the best companies, you know, Disney, the happiest place on earth, has people who hate them. I just don't understand how and why, but it's true. You worked with some of the biggest, bestest brands in the world. And I just want to tell people about your background for just a second. You uh, were involved with Allstate Insurance, Bank of America, American Express. I mean, these are iconic brands. And by the way, if I look at it, there's an A, that's like all the A's of, of Bank that's of right. America, yeah. Allstate. I mean, it's like my my client list. Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> so that's right. I always joke, I list Amazon and American Express and Anheuser-Busch and Aetna and all these, and that's just a few of the A's. You've got quite a resume here. So you've got great background working with some major, major companies. All right, let's talk about social media. Um, we're out there, we're monitoring, assume you're monitoring every channel that's out there. We have an organizational mission to pay attention to what's happening on social media. Uh, when I say we, I mean Fender as a whole. Uh, I can tell you that our executives uh, our marketing team, our digital team, our customer service team, myself, we are constantly scraping the web to see what people are saying about Fender. Specifically, we have a team that is, that is within the marketing and digital teams that that does nothing but obviously look at what's happening on Facebook, provide updates on Facebook, Instagram as examples. And if we see a soundbite or somebody that's not happy, uh, they will forward that immediately to our team. That's part of that closed loop process that I like to call where we're staying in contact with our business partners uh, because the first thing that we're going to do is, is go back and, and contact the customer. 100% of the time, the customer is delighted to hear from us. Even if it's an ugly situation or they've had a bad experience or if it's a perceived bad experience, we really do a great job of reaching out to those customers and saying, hey, tell me a little bit more about what happened are you aware that we can do something for you? And here's our process. And we walk away with a happy customer. Um, we look at Reddit. We look at all these things. In fact, I would tell you that we created an internal, uh, an external communication process uh, on our mod shop process because customers were concerned that there was a long uh, uh, delay in communication. So we actually created an automated feedback loop to the customer that tells them where the guitar is in the journey. And they've been delighted ever since. So and when those, you refer to mod shop, for those that don't know, you're referring to. Yeah, you can go in and create your own uh, guitar, guitar experience out on Fender.com and you can create, you know, the colors, the style, the body style, the necks, all that good stuff. And it allows the customer to see where their guitar is being built and what part of the journey it's on. Mm. And what's really, really been good is that we've taken an unfortunate circumstance because of probably not the best communication and turn it into world-class communication. That's the kind of stuff that we look for. And we stay close because of these issues, because we don't want anybody having a bad experience. All right. Two things. Number one, uh, you figured out where a weakness was and you fixed it. If anybody is listening, if you've got a weakness out there and, and whether it's customer service, whatever the, the chink in the armor is, fix it. There's no reason not to. Number two, you said we reach out to 100% of the customers that leave a negative comment and we turn around and make you say you make them happy just yeah. the fact that you respond is one thing but you actually respond and do something about it yeah and whenever we're made aware we reach out we are not afraid to reach out to the consumer because we never want somebody to walk away with a bad experience and unfortunately perceptions reality for a lot of people and so what we have to do is change that perception so we can help them and hopefully have a return customer in the future yeah. What about your happy customers that leave comments? Do you do anything for them? Oh, yeah. We uh, we actually have a, a whole different marketing strategy around those that we're actually building out. I can't get into the details right now, but we do monitor who is purchasing and what is happening with those customers. And we are starting to build some processes that will 
that will come in the future. I can't get into it right now, but it will allow for us to do even more for the customers that have a, a repetitive buying behavior with us. Wow. Well, I, I've got a repetitive buying behavior. If I start leaving comments, maybe I'll see a new guitar show up. Um, I want one just like that Jaguar behind there. That is a beautiful looking guitar. You've got the uh, the deep red. Um, crimson that's red. Yeah. Crimson red. Beautiful, beautiful guitar. Thank and you. Uh, great looking neck. Uh, I've got a maple neck on both my strats. Uh, I think every, I'm trying to think, yeah, all my all my fenders are maple necks. Anyway, we're getting into something that means nothing to anybody. Let's talk about feedback for the next few minutes. Yes. Um, you've already talked a little bit about it. You've mentioned some, some great words. You've got a, a great way to engage with your customers at every step of the way of their journey. You mentioned that for the people that create their own guitar that want to build from your website. What about uh, your retailers? What about a consumer that's just buying off the shelf, so to speak? Yeah. So what we do is we partner with our external sales partners. So we've got what we call business development managers out in the field, account managers that actually work with our retailers. Um, if our retailers have a specific need or would like to see things on our new products going forward, we all take that feedback. We drive it back to our, our uh, product team and our uh, R&D teams so we can create maybe a different experience going forward into the future. Um, we have call reports that come out on a weekly basis that are based on the visits and or the interactions with our dealers. And whether the feedback is, is good or, or we have opportunities to improve, it's put in those call reports and action immediately. And by the way, those call reports go all the way up to our CEO. So we all read them, we react to them, and we quickly pivot if we need to, you know, get into some sort of corrective action for the retailer. Now, if it gets to the CEO, is that because it was a big problem or is the CEO just trying to keep uh, their finger on the pulse of what's going on with the company? No, I, I, our CEO and all of our executives have a pulse in general about the company. We have a lot of communication routines where we talk about new product implementation, new marketing that's coming out, new digital programs that are coming out, as well as our, our roadmap as far as what's coming out in the future. And we we basically meet as a team to make sure that we're all aligned on what the strategy is as we go into the future. So we're all very engaged in the brand and have a passion for what's happening and where things are going in the future. All right, I'm going to throw a question out there. And by the way, uh, during the break, uh, you, you mentioned I appreciate you not doing any gotcha questions. This really isn't a gotcha question. You may or may not know the answer to this. But since you mentioned the executive team, yeah. uh, do you believe th this is I just wrote an article about this and I'm studying more and more. I, I talk about these gaps yeah. and the gap that I've been focused on uh, so, for so many years is a gap of executives in a company think they're better than their customers actually yeah. think they are. Yeah. Now, I get it. The music industry is a wonderful industry and you are you have an iconic brand within the industry. Do you feel that your executives are really in touch with the reality of what's happening out there or are they just running a company? No, they're very in touch with what's going on out there. Leo Fender uh, made a quote that we always talk about in our town halls or in our meetings, which is, artists are angels. It's our jobs to give them wings to fly. And Ooh. that's really our boom. Call. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that really, out. <laughs> that's really our call to action. Right. And it's, it's something that we all take very seriously. L let me, let me say this a, a, another way. You mentioned the previous companies that I worked for and, and they are great companies, great people, great leadership. And I learned a ton that I've been able to bring to Fender. Um, this company lives, breathes and speaks the brand. And you can tell just by the passion that people have, including our executives on a daily basis, that they want to be here. They want to leave a mark and they want to constantly improve the brand to help artists or potential artists coming up that are young and, and growing into their musical journey that we want to make them as great as that we can be. And we take that feedback and actually do something with it. Um, this is the first company I've been in where I see that coming from the top down. And I would argue all the way back to the top. People genuinely love being here and they live and breathe the brand and what this company is all about. Yeah, I love that. And, and you have the Fender Play app, which is geared toward the consumer learning the guitar. You have your Fender Academy, which is geared toward the retailer learning how to best understand 
the intricacies of your particular brand and the different models that you have so they can better communicate with their customers. You're doing a lot to educate both consumer and retailers, uh, which does nothing more than keep uh, alignment of what you're trying to create. I love that Leo Fender quote. I wrote it down. Artists are angels. Let's give them wings to fly. It's our job to give them wings to fly. Wow. I just love that. All right. We are out of time. I have one final question. You know what's coming. Is there one last nugget of of wisdom that you would like to share with us today? Yeah, I I would say one one to two things. Um, I I said it earlier. I'm going to say it again. Feedback is one of the few things in life life that is free. I would argue that don't be afraid to solicit feedback from your consumers, but also get your feedback from your employees. They are the front line. They know what's going on and whatever they're feeling, you can take that and go run a, an analysis to see if there is uh, teeth to what's going on in the process. And I would just say from a sales and service st- standpoint, you've got to have a passion for people. This is a high contact sport. You, you know, the world is evolving literally on a daily basis and expectations are increasing based on how the shift in buying behaviors are occurring. So don't be afraid to lean into discomfort and try new things, test new things, and then measure it to make sure that it's working the way that you designed it. Wow. Well, if you ask me, what can you learn from a company that builds guitars and sells guitars? I would say pretty much everything. Scott, you've been great. This is why we call it Amazing Business Radio. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me today, Shep. All right, everybody, that wraps it up. Another episode of Amazing Business Radio. We'll be back next week with another interview. I hope you join us. Until that time, this is Shep Hyken reminding you to always be amazing. Amazing.